Hunt with passion. Never stop casting. Chase the dream. Welcome to Season 3 of Musky Mastery Outdoors. Sponsored by Joe Booker Outdoors. Number one in big game fish products. What's up guys and welcome back to another vlog here during the Season 3 Musky Mastery YouTube show. This is vlog number 7 and before we go any further, let me just say a special thank you to all of you subscribers, viewers, supporters out there, my sponsors, Joe Booker Outdoors, St. Croix Rods. I could not do this without you guys. We could not do any of this. This show is for you guys, and you guys get me fired up to do this. I absolutely love the learning segment, the learning portion of the fishing industry. This is what it's all about. I really enjoy being an educator. And, uh, you know, obviously we have the whiteboard now. This is awesome. So guys, welcome to Vlog 7. And uh, go, of course, you know, every one of these vlogs, I seem to be getting more and more fired up about. This particular lure that we're going to talk about today, I can, I can say without a doubt, has produced some of my largest muskies. And it is a big fish lure. It's got a big profile. And it's, it's just a fantastic producer of, of aggressive strikes. The Twin 800 Booker Tail Tinsel. This lure is just awesome. And before we really dive into it, I have some very, very special footage I want to show you that's going to roll the tapes back all the way to 2017. I'm fishing during a brutal northeast wind cold front with my good buddy Mike Richardson. And you're going to see this unfold in just a minute. One of the coolest muskies that I never even thought would make it on air. Until now, this segment is perfect for vlog number seven. You're about to see a muskie we nicknamed Big Bertha. Take a look at this, check it out. It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna dive in and break this fish down right after this. My dad like heard her. So guys, there it is, Big Bertha, the loss of Bertha. I don't know if you saw it. I'm gonna to try to pause it and show it to you right now. You can barely see, but this fish had this giant pink mark on its side. It had, all the scales were missing and that's how it got its name, Bertha. So let's break this down. This fishing day is cold, okay? Even though I'm only in a long sleeve shirt, it's, it's a little chillier than it looks. It's a brutal northeast wind cold front. And really, we have nothing going for us. Therefore, you know, I'm, I'm starting off with, as you see, when Mike initially raised this muskie, I've got a seven inch shallow reader going. Mike is throwing the 500 Booker Tail Tinsel, the downsizer. We're trying to produce activity. I'm leading off with a crankbait, feeling out, you know, the, the weed edge, trying to trigger a strike with a, a pausing, suspending natured lure and Mike's following up with the blade trying to get a fish to come into the figure eight which he does on the downsized lure but very interesting this big muskie now this is a really neat scenario that I actually have to explain a little bit to give you guys kind of an idea of what's going on Mike raises what I believe to be Bertha on the first run through on this spot comes into the figure eight uh now three years ago we didn't have the great camera angles that we have now but you can see M Mike go into the figure eight and I'm like, oh, wow, is it a big fish? I actually remember it like it was yesterday. You could see kind of the, the redness in that fish's, you know, you know, fins. It was an old muskie, a big muskie. But I didn't quite know how big it was at first. I was like, man, that's like a 45-inch class fish. So 
And again, I want to talk about this. We go and do some cast backs on this musky. Okay, so here's the here's the you know we got this like weed flat type situation going on here, just like that. And we raise the musky. Mike raises the musky. Here's the boat. Mike raises the musky here. I'm I'm throwing the uh, the seven inch shallow rigger up here. Mike raises the musky here. Does his figure eight, and we decide to go back after this fish. Now, interestingly. We go and we do some castbacks on this muskie. We actually do three of them. And what I want to point out that you did not see during this big fish uh, video here, the video of Bertha, is when I go back and do a castback on a fish, I am just, and I, those of you who have fished with me or my guide clients know that I'm pretty OCD and analytical and just kind of goofy about when you reapproach, do it right. And by that I mean what we did is you pull your boat off, come back and readjust and start that, start that pass again and make sure that when you do it, now you don't have to always do this, but I, I try to, especially when I know it's a good fish, try to re-approach that fish and just have everything set up properly. Leave the spot, come back, give that fish sometimes a minute or two to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, just relocate or whatever it might be that they're doing and uh, come back and reapproach that spot with just precision. That's the key. And so we ended up coming back two times out of the three, and we actually raised another muskie. I, I ended up raising it on a glide raider. I raised it on something else. I'm not sure what, I think maybe a, maybe a, uh, a JB Rattler. And you know, the fish that actually came back on our cast back was about 40 inches. It was a nice muskie. And I was actually surprised, I'm like, it's a good musky, but it's not the musky that we had follow up initially, that Mike had follow, I should say, on his 500 series. So we go back around for a third cast back, because we had raised this 40 inch or twice, and we came back around a third time, and I said, okay, this time I'm going to upsize. She followed a 500. No, we're not just going to go to the 700, we're going to go to the double eight, the twin 800 tinsel booker tail and see what happens. And all of a sudden I make that cast and I just, I'll never forget when this muskie comes in, I say something to Mike like, oh my God, here she comes, big fish, dude. This was a, and, and the video of course, classically with these, with these cameras does not do the size of this fish justice. This was an upper forties muskie. I believe to be somewhere between 46 and 47 inches long. You can't see it on the camera, but this thing had a Canadian size head. It was just a big, thick musky. She comes right, I mean, she is just right on the back of the double eight. And I make that first turn into the figure eight and she comes and just boom, closes her mouth on the back of the treble and she's be cooked. And I knew it right when she grabbed it. It was, it was a really, really difficult situation. I mean, I had to keep an unbelievable amount of pressure on this fish to, to keep her hooked. And of course it didn't work. I mean, those be cooked muskies, sometimes you get them. And when you get them in the net, sometimes that hook comes right off. Sometimes you can actually drive that, that hook through the upper part of the mouth, but it's very difficult in this situation. It didn't quite work out, but it was a really cool experience and it was an eye-opening experience to, to show that, look, that big fish wanted something big. It followed that 500, but it didn't eat the 500. It went for an upsized presentation. And that is the really beauty of the double eight twin tinsel, the double eight uh, twin eight booker tail tinsel. It's a big fish producer. This is a lure that when it comes through the water column, it has a vibration about it. It has a size profile about it that's just big. And when you're trying to trigger an aggressive strike from a muskie that eh, it only follows something small, but it looked aggressive. Again, initially, just to recap this whole story, northeast wind, I'm trying to trigger strikes with the, uh, the seven inch shallow reader, pausing. Mike is following up with the 500 blade. He gets the fish to come in. Blades, it's amazing. That's why in my previous uh, vlog number six, we did the 500 uh, Booker Tail, why it's so good. I'm telling you, if you're not throwing that 500, you're missing fish because that thing pulls muskies, even in crummy conditions, it'll at least get them to follow. And that's what happened. And that's actually what got us in position to have a chance at Big Bertha. So again, that fish was pretty aggressive. And that is your 
key determining factor a lot of times when you're thinking about upsizing or downsizing. If you've got a muskie that follows in a presentation here, followed in Mike's 500, the key here is that it followed in very aggressively. She took some big looping turns on that 500, but she didn't commit. And I should have honestly, you know, in hindsight, it's much easier to think all, through all these situations. I should have upsized right away. But again, regardless, we got to it. I threw that double eight tinsel in there and she came right in on it. Again, I was just blown away when she was up nice and high on it. Holy cow, big fish, beak hooked. But again, the key takeaways of this are it's a situation where we had a big muskie that would not respond again until we threw a big presentation in there and it elicited this aggressive strike in the figure eight. I wish we had caught that fish. Um, I think we actually ran into that muskie in, in, in uh, another situation about a month after my buddies and I were after Bertha. Uh, you can see again that, that big, uh, just it's about like a six to eight inch long spot on her side that was just missing these scales, a big pink mark, really an eerie fish. The thing that sticks out to me about this muskie is the width across the head. It, it becomes difficult sometimes to gauge length on a muskie when they get so wide, which I thought was a little bit abnormal for northern Wisconsin for the muskies uh, that I was catching on that particular body of water. So very unique fish, but again, Double 800 Booker Tail Tinsel, just an awesome, awesome lure. So let's let's uh, now just break down this lure of why would you throw the double eight? We've talked about the subsize and we're gonna get back to that in just a second. But here's my big picture idea, okay? Is this, that you want your lure lineup, your lures to adapt as an ecosystem adapts over the course of a season. And by that, I mean this, as fish are born you know, you know, and, and they start their lives early in the season, let's just say May, for example, they hatch and they start to grow. That is what they do. They grow and they, they take up different niches in their ecosystem. But again, they're getting bigger as the season progresses. And sometimes very fast, these fish, you know, start small and grow to a bigger size. And generally speaking, as a season progresses, I try to very much now, uh, you know, just kind of have my, my my casting lineup of lures adapt to the size progression of the prey that muskies are chasing. So early in the season, I generally start small. And by the time I get to midsummer, like July 4th and beyond, I'm throwing the big stuff and especially continue that trend as we move toward into the fall part of the season and into ice up. So again, I, and, and that's also a water temperature thing too. You gotta remember, Muskies, like all these fish, are cold-blooded creatures. Their metabolism is strongly dependent on the water temperature. And so why do you start small? Well, you know, muskie metabolism is slower early in the season. They're trying to bask in the sun. You're looking for areas with the warmest water in the lake as possible. But again, when you get to the to the mid part of the season, I mean, your water temps in a lot of these areas are, you know, mid 70s and above approaching that that kind of that dangerous area of 80 degrees surface temps. And at that point, musky metabolism perhaps is at its prime as far as their, their body temperature is concerned. And so again, I try to time and not just as this is a generalization, I time my throwing of bigger lures like the twin 800 tinsel at, you know, at a time in the season, like July and beyond, that midsummer part, which is when this muskie actually struck, um, I time that. I try, to, I try to mimic my lure size to match that progression of, of growth of the prey in the, in the ecosystem during that time. So, so that's one of the, my, just my ideologies when I'm thinking of the 800 twin tinsel. Now, let's get back to this thing, triggering aggressive strikes from muskies. Here's again, we go back to our opening video, video segment here. Here's a muskie that followed aggressively, didn't strike. What do you do? Upsize. What do you do when a muskie comes in and she's aggressive but doesn't eat? Try upsizing. I mean, it's really a neat idea. You know, when a muskie comes in on a, on a uh, I don't know, some kind of lure and, it, and it's kind of lazy or isn't really cooperating, then we downsize. Then we try going smaller. But when a muskie comes in on a bait and it looks aggressive but doesn't eat, then it's time to upsize, especially if it's a big fish. It's so cool to see big fish sometimes respond extremely aggressively to a big presentation. I'm not so sure if it if it's like a macho thing where they're like, whoa, okay, you know, I'll, I'll uh, you know, 
chase this little lure out of my my zone but when a big bigger lure comes in i can't handle that Boom. i'm gonna eat it i think there could be some of that going on sometimes it's a it's an aggressive triggering mechanism but that's that the whole idea of upsizing and uh, you know just also remember that the twin 800 can also be a downsizer too in a number of circumstances if you're throwing a a uh, Magnum Twin 10 booger tail, or if you're throwing a nine inch shell reader, or a glide reader, or a big lure, and a musky follows in an even bigger presentation, downsizing to the Twin 800, well, it's it's a downsize. But a lot of times when I'm throwing a 500 or a 700 or a, a baby shell reader, and I get kind of an aggressive strike, upsizing to the double eight is a fantastic tactic. And then again, is, is at the heart of this, these all kind of blend together, but the Twin 800 is an awesome cast back lure as well. In particular, in one of the most deadly, deadly scenarios to throw the Twin 800 as a cast back is when you've got a muskie that follows a top raider. I don't know what it is about muskies that follow top raiders that don't strike initially. That first lure that you want to throw back at that muskie that follows the top raider is a twin 800. I don't know what it is, but they seem to eat the 800s that follow when they're following top raiders. And then lastly, when we're talking about why, again, just to sum up here, we've talked about mimicking changes in the ecosystem. We've, talking about, we've talked about uh, upsizing to trigger aggressive strikes or downsizing, depending on what size of lure you're throwing. Uh, we've talked about cast back, in particular, deadly on uh, muskies that follow uh, top raiders. And now, lastly, one of the whys, why throw a, a Twin 800? Night fishing. I don't film this a lot because I lose the great lighting that, uh, that you need to, uh, you know, to film a show, but I do quite a bit of night fishing in northern Wisconsin from July 4th and beyond from a, for a variety of reasons, to escape the boat traffic and the fishing pressure. Uh, it's just cool, okay? If you haven't night fished, I mean, you're, you're, you're missing out. It's really a neat experience once you get used to it. One of my all-time favorite night fishing lures, especially in Canadian waters, you've seen Joe Booker and I film some awesome stuff on the Twin 800 at night. It's just a great lure to fish at night. It, it just produces so much vibration. It's also very easy to fish, generally speaking. I mean, you can just you can just bomb it and retrieve it at a at a medium medium pace at night, and muskies eat it. They just hone in on that vibration. And again, you know. I guess I'll say one more thing as to why. When you've got muskies that are on a big bait bite, by that I mean muskies just aren't eating smaller lures. And again, this is something that I typically see in northern Wisconsin at that midsummer point. The Twin 800 is an awesome lure to throw. And, and for this reason, too, a lot of you guys and gals out there, you know, we've got the technology and the reels and rods now to throw double tens. But for a lot of folks, throwing double tens for 10 hours is not an option, even for me at 32 years old. I don't know if I look 32 right now, but I am. Uh, throwing a double 10 for a prolonged period of time is really difficult, even when you've got the technology to a certain extent. For, for the you know majority of anglers out there, they're tough to throw. The double eight is a really neat kind of uh, spot in that lineup. It's bigger than the 700. It's not quite as daunting to throw as the, not even, not even nearly daunting uh, as the uh, double tennis to throw. So it is kind of a nice niche in there as far as a lure that produces a big profile and a lot of vibration, but it's not super hard on the body. Now, we've kind of talked about this, but when to throw the double eight, like a lot of my lures, especially blades, you can throw this from ice out until ice up. I have caught muskies on double eights throughout the entire spectrum of the season. It really does not matter. But if you were to put a hundred bucks on the table and say, Chas, when is your best time to throw the double eight? I would say during the midsummer period. Big Bertha was a, a mid-July fish. I believe the date was actually July 23rd. And uh, that's that's when I feel like when I've got those, those water temperatures that have peaked, the weed growth has peaked, we're going to talk about the, the uh, technique here in just a bit. When you've got to get got to get that Twin 800 bulging right under the surface, that's when I'm having my best success in the Twin 800. And of course, to match with that peak boat pressure during the July 4th period. Um, it is a go-to bait in the fall. Uh, I talk a lot about this in cold water temperatures. Blades are a fantastic option. A lot of folks have this misconception, as did I, that blades are a no-go during the fall period. Oh, they're too fast. Hello, 
All you've got to do is slow down your retrieve and all of a sudden, kaboom, blades become an essential part of your lure lineup. So the 2800, as far as when, I mean, again, if I'm putting hundred bucks on the table, July, August, September, that's like my go-to time period, I would say, when I'm really relying on it. But I have found tremendous success on that particular lure in the fall period in October and November, just simply by slowing down my retrieve. And of course, I talked a little bit about night fishing. Now, the technique with the Twin 800, how is that any different than any of the other lures that we've used? Well, it is a little bit, and I'm gonna talk about that. So I'm gonna repeat a couple things. If you're a first time watcher and vlog number seven here is your first vlog you're tuning into on the Muskie Mastery channel, when we're talking blades, the first and most important thing, and I'm repeating uh, what we've talked about uh, with the 500 Booger Tail and the 700 Booger Tail, is that really a key to this, and I see this and I really hone in on this as a guide, is this idea of synchronization. And it's a big fancy term and all it means is that it's the timing between when you cast the twin eight out there, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're allowing a little bit of tension with your thumb on the spool as the lure flies out, but you're thumbing the spool and you're stopping it, like I, at least I like to do, to really stop the lure right before it hits the surface, it aligns everything, and it drops in and the blades start their revolution immediately. And once you do that, I really like to burst it. There's an old uh, line, I believe it's a Bill Sandy line and a Joe Booker line is, make them want it. Make them want it. I mean, really crank aggressively in that first five feet. It'll trigger a muskie right out of hiding. I try to, I try to do that even when I'm gonna slow roll a lure, for example, we'll talk about that as far as techniques concerned. I really like right, right after synchronization and you lock that handle in and you start cranking, I like to burst it, okay? That just gets that momentum going for a big lure, a big presentation. And again, that takes us to the second and, and really uh, super important topic as far as techniques concerned. And on a lure, we've talked about this uh, very much, on a lure that comes in pretty much on a straight line. You know, again, you look at your, your different types of lures out there, again, You've got a, a twin 800, okay, essentially, right up here. If this is your boat, okay, and you're, and you're you know, going from left to right here, the twin 800, relatively speaking, has what we call, you know, just, just a, a line pattern, it's just a straight line. You've got a depth rater, for example, has a C pattern, it dives and comes back up. And then you've got, again, some kind of lure, maybe like the JB Randall, if it hits, you can kill it. Crank, kill, crank, kill, crank, crank, something. So that's much more in a, a I guess I'd call it, um, oh, what's the, what's the term I'm looking for? It's in manual mode is what I like to say for something like the JB Rattler. But again, what I'm trying to point out here, why is speed so important with a blade? Well, because there's not really a lot else going on. You're cranking something that's coming in on a straight line. You can weave, you can move back and forth with the rod and long rods help. But again, the speed with a blade is your number one thing that you're gonna manipulate. It's all about manipulation. If you're out there and you're just cranking a blade at the same speed all day long, sure you'll catch muskies, no doubt about it. But if you wanna increase your effectiveness, change your speed. So ways that I change my speed, bursting. When I'm going, I'm cranking hot and then back off a little bit. Crank hot back off a little bit, crank hot, back off, and then you come right into that figure eight. Uh, slow rolling, again, I've talked about this a lot, but when, when you're, you're cranking, and then you just start to slow it down, and you can really slow your retrieve speed just enough until those blades are moving. As long as those blades are moving, you're fine. Slow rolling is a fantastic technique. And figure eight, we're gonna go right into the equipment part with this, a, 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 a figure eight, is essential to finish a cast with any lure you're throwing. The Twin 800 tinsel is no different. But again, what, I, what I've, I've talked about this, and I'm gonna talk about it again here, is when you're, when you're coming into your figure eight, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna work the equipment right into this, okay? When you're coming into your figure eight here, I'm gonna draw a nice little figure eight. You're coming in like this, and there you go. That initial kind of uh, introduction of the lure into the eight, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm using red to signify hot. I really like to move that blade fast. 
I think that, you know, you know, you know, you don't want to do this too fast. I say that to guide clients uh, all the time and it's like, <sighs> they're just moving. It's a throth of water. It's, it's, you can definitely overdo it. But just come into the figure eight with some charisma. Come in with, uh, you know, again, remind yourself that you're trying to emulate uh, something that's being chased by a monster. So if you're going to be uh, chased by a monster, let's say a black bear or something, the last thing you're going to do is start slowing down. But again, we do it to make it easy on the muskie. So I'll use our, our blue cooler color here. And as I get to those turns, sometimes I'll slow it down and then we'll move fast through the middle. And that's actually another, uh, and you know, I can't really show this super well. Maybe I'll try the purple here. This middle section of the figure eight, by the way, as we're talking technique, this is when you can really, and you can do this any and during any part of the figure eight, this is your, your vertical, your vertical um, change, okay? Your vertical change. Did I spell that incorrectly? I think it's vertical. You know, that's one thing as a teacher, you can't be afraid to make mistakes in the whiteboard. Vertical depth change, vertical depth change. And what I mean by that going through the middle, we call this the spy. The spy is when you're going through the middle, you can actually raise the, the blade super high in the water column. We talk a lot about keeping the lure down, but one of the cool things you can do, we call this the spy technique. Joe Booker and I have a couple really cool episodes on the Fishing with Joe Booker channel that show this technique, I believe with actually a double eight uh, Goldilocks and, and the one that I'm in, uh, is that as you, as you go around that turn, and it, you know, with these nine foot, eight foot, six rods that we're all using for blades, you know, you've got that lure down real deep. And all of a sudden, well, a lot of times if you're in stained water, like I fish most of the time, you want to bring that lure up to the surface real quick, see if she's there. You're spying on the muskie to see if she's still following and whoop, dip right back down. So your vertical depth change, your vertical vertical depth manipulation is very important. You've always, you've, you've obviously got your horizontal change. Don't forget about the vertical change. Very important as far as strike triggering uh, in the figure eight. Now, equipment. The Twin 800 falls in, in kind of two different categories. Generally speaking, I, I, it just depends on my mood. It depends on, I, it depends on my mood. I would say the rod of choice for me really, it really varies a little bit between the, the Legend Elite Musky nine foot medium heavy and the Legend Elite eight six uh, heavy power fast. The eight six heavy power fast would probably get my vote as a little bit more effective uh, as far as rods are concerned because when you go into the figure eight with something that, that just has such a pulling power, it has so much resistance in the water when you've got two double eight blades you know, revolving at once, you don't want to have you know, your rod bending and you certainly, you know, a great example of what I'm talking about is if, if you've ever tried figure eighting a twin 10 with a medium heavy rod, you see very quickly how ineffective you are. You cannot make big turns or you have to really involve your body and you're just, you have no power. It's all about having, that's why it's called power in a rod. It's all about having the right power. So the Legend Elite, again, it's an eight foot six heavy power, LEM 86 HF, heavy power to enable you to make turns uh, quickly and efficiently, we'll call it effectively. Efficiently and effectively are my, my descriptor words there. You need to make sure that you are, you know, you're not lagging behind the muskie. You know, if you've got a big bait and, muskie, and muskies are following into that figure eight fast, you don't want to lose fish because you can't keep up with the speed that you need to trigger a strike because your rod power is too weak. So looking for an excuse to buy a new rod, there's a great reason. You gotta have a heavy power so that you're not lagging on your figure eight speed and timing. Uh, what's my, my line of choice? JBO's B sprayed. I generally speaking throw 80 pound B sprayed in the tannic brown. I'm fishing a lot of stained water. 80 pound test tannic brown is the, the line of choice. Now, lastly here, and I'm sure I'll think of something else to throw in, but lastly, modifications. The biggest modification that I make to my uh, 2800 Booker Tails is the hook size. And I talk about this all the time. The hooks that come straight out of the package, those black and nickel VMCs that JBO puts on there, are fantastic for literally 90% of applications. But sometimes, just because we're all 
you know, musky geeks and musky nuts, you know, sometimes you tweak things. And so one thing that I do is I put I really will upsize the hook size quite a bit. They come with, generally speaking, I believe fives, or fives or sixes on the 2800. I will upsize that hook to a seven or even an eight. The beauty of the tinsel, if you're using a tinsel model 2800, is that you can really hide a gigantic hook. And you know me, I'm a big fan of hiding hooks in your lure. Uh, so, Hiding giant hooks, I guess, what I'm saying, inside the profile of that lure. When you're when you're after big muskies, let's say you're fishing Canadian waters, big hooks are where it's at when you're when you're going after big muskies. So that's one modification. The second modification that I make, and I think it'd be best to draw a little picture of this. Now, I'm not gonna name any any weights here, but what I what I do, some of you folks know that when you're you're fishing blades, you know, for 10 hours, you can get line twist. Even when you've got a good ball bearing swivel. Um, and, I'll, and by the way, uh, I didn't mention this in the equipment. I told you I'd come up with something different. Uh, I am a big fan, especially for blade fishing, the 11 inch, I call it the 981 model. It's just a steel leader JBO makes. And uh, it's the 981, 11 inch steel leader. It's the no BS system. And, uh, even with a good ball bearing swivel, you can still get line twists. And to avoid that, when you're fishing, so this is the second modification I'll explain here. Let me see if I can, I can draw this. So here's the, the big double A blades, here's the shaft of the, of the lure, and here's your, your tinsel, okay? So here's your tinsel, uh, here's your treble hook, something like this, and uh, like that, okay, that looks pretty good. And, Oh, I, I did forget when we talked about technique, I have to talk about bulgy and the lure and what that means. We'll get back to that in just a second. But again, uh, now you've got your, your, uh, your beads up here and things like that. So what I do is I take a, a big ag sinker like that you would use uh, in um, drop shot fishing for smallies or largemouth bass. When you're drop, drop shot fishing for bass, you can take an ag sinker and connect it to a split ring and connect the split ring right to the shaft of the uh, of the of the booker tail here and it will hang it's not going to affect anything and I usually do this you know ahead of the tinsel uh, tie you can connect your egg sinker it's just a kind of a an oval shaped egg a sinker and I will connect that to the middle of of kind of the you know in between the blade and the the, the, the tie there for the tinsel. What that's gonna do is it's gonna keep your, your uh, Twin 800 running without twisting as much in the water. It really will not affect anything. Of course, you need to make sure that it's not gonna get in the way and interfere with the blade revolution. But that's one of the coolest little tips I have to, I have to say that when you're fishing blades or especially if you're trolling, if you're trolling big blades, which we do a lot in the fall, talk about another uh, technique wise thing, we're trolling blades. The ag sinker keeps everything in line and it, and it avoids this, this twisting that can happen over a long period of time. So that's one of the coolest things. Now, one last thing as far as techniques concerned. We talked about synchronization. We talked about speed. And so this fits into the category of speed. I forgot to mention this is bulging. Now, what is bulging a bucktail? What does that mean? If you're, if you're listening to this, you're saying, hmm, I don't do that. This is something that I do with uh, double eights all the time. Bulging just means that you're cranking so fast you get up to a, a velocity where you're actually making a bulge on the surface. It almost looks as if you're cranking a topwater lure in. But again, it's, it's a subsurface uh, twin 800 tinsel, but it looks like a top rater. You've actually got a bulge of water coming in I will, I will employ this technique when I'm casting back on a muskie. Like, let's say, again, follow the top reader. Uh, that muskie becomes a great candidate for a cast back with a double eight. Instead of just cranking it in real slow, I will just burn and churn it, burn it in, and bulge it right under the surface so there's this big silhouette coming through the water, and that's when, pow, they grab it. Another time that I have to bulge the bucktail, not on a cast bag, is when I'm when I'm fishing and I've got a really, really, and this is a great time to do it too. When you've got, you know, let's say you're fishing over a cabbage bed and you have a very small area, let's just say like this. I mean, your, your area of distance here between the top of your weed cover and the surface of the water is very small. That's when you've got to get it in, synchronize quickly, 
and bulge it right under the surface. It's gonna create this big, big profile, this big wave as you retrieve it. And again, it almost, I mean, it allows you to almost keep it an inch under the surface. It's literally directly under the surface. So we've talked about a number of different things, the why, when, the technique, equipment, some really cool modifications, and we broke down one of the most legendary fish that was never going to make it to the channel, Big Bertha. I'm sure Big Bertha is still out there somewhere. I don't know if those scales have grown back. I like to think that she's still got that pink mark on her side. Uh, I hope to run into her maybe, maybe 2020 is the year. Well, guys, as always, I really hope you've enjoyed this vlog number seven, these educational segments. Please keep the comments coming. If you've got an additional comment or a question that you wanna throw in that I didn't cover or something specific to your body of water, please leave it in the comments section. I will get back to you for sure on that. Uh, again, thanks for all the support. Please stay healthy and safe out there. And as always, thanks for watching.